This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. This is Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Today on Southern Remedy, we are re-airing some of your phone calls from the last several months. I have optic neuritis, which has basically the nova set in one of my eyes. I have a very high ANA that's been discovered and polyarthritis. Trying to get into a rheumatologist uh, down here on the coast is virtually impossible. So what are my options and what do I have? I have not been officially diagnosed with anything at this point because I can't get in to see anybody. Yeah. So a couple of things, and you're right, we don't have enough rheumatologists in the state and particularly certain parts of the state, but I would go ahead and see if you can get a placeholder on an appointment even if it's going to be six months from now, uh, you know, as a follow-up, because it sounds like with those symptoms, that may be somebody that that is going to be key in getting to the uh, correct diagnosis and maybe, you know, what the uh, treatment might be. So, you know, optic neuritis, as you mentioned, so it's a loss of vision through damage to the optic nerves that connect to the back of our eye and connects the eye to the brain. It can be from a number of things. So uh, it can be from a loss of myelin or an autoimmune process that's really damaging those nerves. An ANA, uh, anti-nuclear antibody, is one of the tests that, and I know you probably know this, Gail, but I'm just, uh, just for everybody else that's listening, you know, that's, that's one of the tests that we get to help us with a diagnosis uh, of an autoimmune process. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have lupus or you have this or that. It's not that specific, but it can help with the other symptoms. And autoimmune processes are very frustrating for a lot of people, uh, both, you know, patients certainly, and then also for physicians that are trying to to get to the bottom of it, uh, just because they take some time. I would go, here's what I would do. I would go to an internal medicine doctor that's been in practice for about 20 to 30 years if you can find them as a second opinion, and um, I would I would really you know say hey I, I've got this and may, it might even be beneficial to have a new person look at it that's you know has that kind of experience, and they may can offer some insight into some of the things that it might be. Another person, if you haven't already, I, I assume because you said optic neuritis. Um, that you uh, have already seen an ophthalmologist, but a neuro-ophthalmologist might be somebody else that sort of crosses that gap between neurology and uh, and um, uh, ophthalmology. And there's not a whole lot of those. We do have one in Jackson, uh, several in Jackson, that Mike could, could look at you and see if they could uh, provide some benefit. So you might want to get a referral to a, to a center like that, or I don't know, maybe Mobile or, or New Orleans. <laughs> Let's go to Kevin in Biloxi. Good morning, Kevin. Hey, doctor. Got a question about essential tremor disorder. Sure. My uh, my uh, osteopath, because I went to him after after noticing the shaking in my hand and on my chest, and I went to him and he diagnosed it as essential tremor disorder. Now my question is, he put me on gabapentin, which he upped my gabapentin from 650 to 12, uh, 1300 milligrams a day. Now, I think it's getting worse. Is this just something I'm going to have to live with? Well, if it's getting worse, well, essential tremor, it's, it's one of the most common tremors in adults. Um, and it usually, it involves the hands and it's brought on by, by your, when you, you know, have any kind of movement in your arms, uh, or if you're, you know, holding your arm out against gravity. Uh, it is slowly progressive. It's usually not quickly progressive, though, and it can affect the head, the voice, and uncommonly the legs. 
Um, so there's a, a number of things that you can do. Gabapentin is one. That is a medication that's used. It was originally used as a seizure medication, and then it was also well, I, have used, a seizure, I have a seizure disorder. Oh, okay. Okay. So they may be using it for both things then. Um, but, you know, usually it's, it's um, you, you use medications if it becomes, a, you know, a, a problem. There are other medications out there, though. Uh, Gabapentin is actually not one of the first line, but they, like you said, they may be uh, using that for two different purposes with the seizure disorder and with the tremor. But there are things like uh, uh, Promodone and uh, Propranolol are two uh, that work a little bit differently. Um, and uh, there's some other things that you can do, too. I mean, there's a lot of, of other advanced, uh, particularly if it gets really bad. But I would, I would probably step back. Is this a neurologist, you said, or just a general? Um... No, osteopath. Yeah. Osteopath. Okay. So um, – you may want to, if it's not getting better with that, suggest or ask some questions about other therapies for that, like the Promodone and the Propranolol. If if you can't tolerate that, or if there's a reason why you can't go on that, then going to see a neurologist, I think, at that point would be the next step. Um, now, if it's if it is just related to your hands or arms, sometimes there's even like uh, um, botulinum toxin injections can be uh, uh, something that they can do. Usually, those are just for the voice. If it's a, it starts to affect your voice, though. So, um, but I would I would go back to your main doctor and say, hey, this is doesn't seem to be working. Is there anything else that you can do? And at that point, they may even want to send you to the neurologist because they're sort of the experts on this. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, and since I'm not in the studio this morning, we are re-airing some recent phone calls with your medical questions. Craig from Biloxi. Good morning, Craig. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm going to shoot out my question here and take it off the air. Uh, how many ways are there to look into the body that is minimally or non-invasive, in, and you might start with laparoscopic, maybe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm a huge fan of Star Trek, and I, I had dreamed before, you know, Star Trek, the next generation came on TV about the same when I was in high school and then some in college, too. And, you know, the medical side of that in science fiction and some of the things that, that they did on the show, I would think, man, if we just had some ways to do that, we wouldn't have to stick anybody. We wouldn't have to do some of the surgeries. And it's amazing in that short period of time from the late 90s, uh, late 80s, uh, to now, some of the things that are available. And certainly there's a lot of tests that have been very useful. However, there's some other things that, you know, it's just not prime time yet. And everybody wants to do mentally invasive things. And uh, sometimes they're good for some things and sometimes they're not. So I, I'll just start off with a broad category of imaging. Uh, so imaging can be anything from x-rays to CT scans to MRI scans, PET scans. And these all look at different things in different ways inside the body without actually having to cut open the body. And they're very, oh, I, should, I should add ultrasound in there too. Um, so all of these use different modalities to, uh, to image things inside the body. And the definition of those have been, has gotten a whole lot better. I can remember when the MRI first came out and it was uh, pretty fuzzy uh, compared to now. We all thought it was so cool that we could see things like that. Um, but uh, now they've gotten really good, even for x-rays. Digital x-ray technology has gotten a whole lot better. Uh, ultrasounds have gotten a lot more specific. We do we use ultrasound really as an extension of the physical exam now uh, at the bedside. So uh, a lot of people listening may have experience where you go to the doctor and uh, – uh, like they'll maybe do an ultrasound in the office or they'll do an ultrasound in the emergency room. Um, so that's mentally invasive. So some things are more invasive, but um, it's not as as much of a uh, of cutting you open, if you want to use that that metaphor. So um, so uh, some surgeries are like that. You mentioned laparoscopic surgeries. Laparoscopic is where they use a lighted tube or multiple tubes 
that they can go inside different places and they can do surgeries or they can do procedures in ways that don't require uh, the old traditional way of, of a surgical um, operation to do it. Uh, one of the coolest things is valve replacements now. So they can actually do those through an artery in your arm to go up to the heart. They don't have to cut you open in the chest, and they can replace uh, a couple of different valves, the mitral valve, the aortic valve. They've gotten really good at doing those, and there's lots of, of really good training to do those. So uh, other surgeries, cancer surgeries, those are all things that have gotten a lot better to do with not uh, having to cut people open like that. So lots of different things, but just because it's mentally invasive uh, doesn't mean that's for everything. There's still some things that you still you just can't get to very well, um, but uh, getting to your doctor that has experience with that and can tell you the pluses and minuses, and sometimes you'll have a choice of which one to choose, but certainly a lot of different ways that we've improved over the last 20, 30 years to, uh, to uh, cause less damage to tissue. We're going to go to Rachel from Eupora. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning, doctor. So uh, I would like to hear you expound on the term leaky gut. You have cells in your gut on the lining of it. And the layman's explanation would be basically uh, some substances need to be absorbed through there, uh, and sub- some uh, substances need to not be excreted into the inside of the intestine. So you want to be able to absorb everything you need uh, and not have to add you know, that, much thing, that, that many things back to it. Now, there are lots of conditions. If you have a leaky gut... It means that those little places where those cells meet each other, they're widened out and they leak. And you leak all kinds of things. You can leak uh, the interstitial fluid. That's the fluid that's around the cells that can be excreted back into the interior of the intestines. And it can cause a really nasty, watery diarrhea. Um, And it can also leak a lot of nutrients, too, so that you're not adequately absorbing things that you need. Now, what causes this? You can have it from infection. You can have it from abnormalities in the bacteria that are in the intestine normally. You know, we have a lot of bacteria in our intestines. Another thing that can cause that is an autoimmune process, and there's a a few that can do that. So you can have uh, colitis, which is just an inflammation of the colon, or you can have other conditions where you have a leaky bowel And the manifestations of that or the symptoms of that is going to be that sort of watery diarrhea. Good morning, Ben. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, enlarged prostate. Yeah. And was was, uh, given Flomax. Uh Uh-huh. And it doesn't seem to be working that great. Is there any other medication that they could use? Yeah, there's there's several. So um, that's a common thing. Ben, how old are you? Do you mind me asking? 72. 72. Okay. Young, 72. Okay. So uh, basically, you know, as we get older, uh, at least men, that prostate gland can enlarge and it can sometimes cause some uh, some symptoms of decreased urination or, or a decreased stream, uh, forceful stream, and sometimes it can even have overflow incontinence with it. So there's several different ways to to shrink that prostate down. All of the medications take a while to work, and I'm not talking about like a week. Sometimes it can take months to work. So that's one thing to keep in mind that not always, you know, when I put people on medications like this, I try to do that. Um, But uh, Flomax is one that you take either once or twice a day, and it can help to shrink those tissues. Some people, it helps more than others, though. Then there are other medications that you can either try separately from that that work in a little bit different way to sort of block either. It's really two two ways. One is it sort of shrinks those tissues down from, from one or two different uh, pathways. But a lot of times you have to, to um, add them together. Uh, so some of the other medications you can you can add together to the Flomax. Um, I would just call your physician and say, hey, is there an alternative to this? They may want you to, to see a, a urologist. A lot of people, if you... If you can't really tolerate or you can't take the, like, Flomax, which is probably one of the more popular ones, the uh, common ones to try out first, and it's not really giving getting you relief, then they could add something else to that. Um, 
but some of them will go ahead at that point and, and send you to a urologist. Most of the time we will check a, a PSA test too, which I'm sure you've had, um, which is basically just a blood test looking at the prostate specific antigen. And that can be elevated. Uh, the number can be elevated um, with enlargement of the prostate, but it's typically uh, much higher elevations you want to look for for prostate cancer in those situations, but uh, I would just have that um, that uh, discussion with them. But there's a there's a couple of different things people try over the counter things too, like um, Sol Palmetto. Uh, it has a weak effect on the prostate in my experience with it um, in in telling patients about it. But um, it can, in some individuals, if it's just sort of mild uh, symptoms that they're having, that can tend to shrink it down. But I would give it one more chance with a separate medication or added to the Flomax and give it about a month or two to work. And if that's not getting you anywhere, that's the point where I think I would go see a urologist for some some other uh, second opinion on other things you could do. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you for calling, Ben. Yeah, that's one that gives a lot of people a lot of problems, uh, a lot of men problems as they get older, and uh, it can be a hassle to deal with. But it does take a long time to see an effect with those medications. And basically, you're either blocking a hormone receptor for that or you're acting in a couple other different ways to uh, really shrink that tissue over time. But it is not, It you know, a lot of people will just prescribe it and say, okay, let me know if you're having any if it's not working, and a day later they call back and say, hey, this isn't working, or I stopped it. But it it, it does take some time to do that, and certainly your physician should be uh, letting you know about that. Uh, what can you do to prevent that? A lot of people ask those questions, too. Hey, my dad has this. There's not really much to, to make a huge impact there. Um, certainly, if you take, we talked about hormones, mainly female hormones earlier. Uh, if you take male hormones, it could actually make it worse because that prostate is stimulated by testosterone uh, or its derivatives. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things to keep in mind if you're if you are being prescribed testosterone. You want to make sure you're doing it, uh, that your physician's doing it correctly and that you're not having any potential problems with that. Uh, and that's another reason to sort of look at the prostate, even if you're younger and not having any problems, if you're on testosterone, that's something that certainly should be looked at sequential, sequentially over time while you're on it, because it can put you at risk for things like prostate cancer. Let's go to Pat from Gulfport. Good morning, Pat. Yes, good morning. Thank you for calling. What's your question this morning? Well, I was wondering about the statins. Uh, my husband has been on them for uh, many years, and um, he's been uh, talking about muscle um, problems. And I was just wondering, it, is there a problem staying on them for too long? Is there anything else that he can do to help um, with the muscle pain and weakening that he's experiencing? Yeah, that's a common question with statins. Um, for the rest of our listeners, Statins are a group of medications that were developed to lower cholesterol levels, particularly LDL uh, cholesterol, but more importantly, to reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke. And um, they're very useful medications that can decrease significantly those risks. Uh, one of the sort of breakthroughs in the, in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, and it can have big beneficial effects. And you don't have to wait until you, ideally, you don't have to wait until you have a heart attack or stroke to be on them. Um, so now we do a risk assessment, which looks at a number of cardiovascular risk factors that go into an equation. And if your your number is high enough, about 7.5% sort of is our cutoff, then that that you know, necessitates a discussion with the patient to say, okay, this is something that, that you probably need to take to reduce that risk. Uh, the risk reduction is over time, though. So you're talking about a about a 10-year period in the studies that people were on these to show that risk reduction. So your question about, you know, how long should you stay on it, the longer the better from the cardiovascular okay. risk reduction. Now, mm. it, it, it is, there are a few patients that do have problems with either muscle weakness or muscle soreness. And yeah. There's no real predicting. Or it would be great if we could predict who was going to get it and who wasn't. Sometimes those are specific to individual statins. In other words, 
if you're on, I'm just going to pick one. It's not necessarily one that would cause more than the others, but if you're on a Torvastatin or Lipitor, it might, uh, for that individual person, cause a problem with uh, the muscle aches or pains, and maybe Crestor or Resuvastatin would not. So okay. sometimes, sometimes changing statins um, may may actually alleviate some of those. Typically, okay. if I have patients that have it, there is a a, a a few labs that I would check on them. One of which is a, called a CK uh, creatinine kinase, and if it's high enough, uh, your physician is going to know the, you know what those numbers need to be. If it's high enough, then I might you know get them off the stat and see see how they're doing. There are some other alternatives to lower cholesterol. They just don't have the same lowering of that risk of a heart attack or stroke. But if it's really bothering him, there may be a lot of patients will take coenzyme Q10, um, and they have found the studies don't really bear this out, but I have some patients that have taken this, and they say, you know, my, my muscle aches go away um, okay. when they take that. So he may want to yeah. want to try that. The other thing to, to maybe do is to talk with his physician about every other day therapy, so sometimes taking it every other day uh, or several times a week rather than every day can alleviate those symptoms. But if he's really having a problem, I would, if he were my patient, I would probably switch to a different statin and see if he had less symptoms that way or maybe even hold the statin and see if those symptoms go away. If they persist, it's not from the statin. It may be from something else. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All okay. right, Pat. Thank you for calling. You have a great day. You've got mail. So this is about a um, a six-year-old son is on Adderall for ADHD. So that's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He has night terrors at bedtime, even taken clonidine for sleep at night. Any idea on why children have night terrors when trying to go to sleep? So really common uh, issue for kids. Um, Night terrors, actually, my, uh, I, I had this when I was uh, younger, and uh, sometimes it can run into, in families. It has sort of a genetic predisposition. Um, night terrors is when it usually happens between 4 and 12 years of age, and it's in the first third of the time that a child goes to sleep. So if you just break up that time at night, let's say it's, uh, you know, it's nine hours, then uh, in the first three hours of that, usually the child will, they'll act like they're wide awake, they'll be screaming, they'll be afraid, but you'll talk to them and they won't know what you're saying at all. Um, and they just scream and scream and scream. They can go back to sleep and they won't remember anything the next day. So it is really terrifying for the parent not so much for the child. And it's one of these uh, disorders that's called the parasomnias. That just means there are things that happen around the time that we fall asleep or during the night. So uh, sleepwalking is another one. Nightmares is another one. But uh, night terrors, there's not much to do about that. The biggest thing is making the environment safe. So in other words, if that child's on a bunk bed or maybe the bed's up high, they're, they're not going to be in control of their environment in the way that they normally would if they would wake up. So uh, making sure that there's not anything that they can hurt themselves in the room. You don't have to pad the whole thing up, but you, know, you may want to just secure doors and windows, uh, clearing of the bedroom from, of, uh, that they sleep in, of obstructions, those kinds of things. That some people have given medications for this, and clonidine is not necessarily one of them. That's an old blood pressure medication that is also used sometimes for uh, an adjunct uh, for ADD and for sleep. Um, but there's not. There may be a couple other medications that you might want to give, but most of the time these go away on their own. They can last months to years sometimes, but it, again, it doesn't really cause any problem with the child. Um, one thing that you can do is make sure that they are getting enough sleep is make sure you have a set time that you uh, have that they go to sleep and make sure that's a quiet environment so because we know that uh, if you if sleep deprivation can actually make these worse. Um, and, but again, from the child standpoint, they do really well with these. They don't really cause any long-term problems. We don't really know why that they happen, but usually reassurance and rearranging the bedroom are the things to do for those and just to know that, that everything's fine. And uh, you, you can just sort of redirect the child when they're having that back to their bed uh, and just uh, allow them to go back to sleep.
Got another email about uh, dr- possible drug rashes. You know, a rash can be caused by lots of different things. Certainly in pediatrics, we see them a little bit more commonly than in adults. And it can be lots of different things. It can be things that you come into contact with, both physical contact or maybe it's in the air and you breathe it in. It could be an allergic response to something. <clears throat> Sometimes rashes can be from infections like uh, viral infections, which are very common in children. A lot of adenoviruses, enteroviruses that can cause those. And some of them can be in a certain pattern that you can uh, help in the diagnosis of it. Uh, Fist disease is one that comes to mind that's sort of a slap cheek appearance uh, with a a rash that's pretty typical of that. Uh, Or the rash that you get with chicken pox. We don't see a lot of chicken pox anymore, but that was fairly characteristic of that, or measles. Um, Thankfully, we don't have uh, much of either one of those because of vaccinations. So uh, rashes can be caused by a number of things, but the particular question was about a drug interaction. And uh, that's uh, something that's fairly common. If you read on the side effects of just about every drug, they'll have listed a rash being one of the potential side effects. It generally is pretty low for most medications. Some of them can cause a rash when combined with other things like Sun exposure uh, is one that um, that is very common, but um, that it's not necessarily a drug reaction. Sometimes it is in combination, as we just mentioned, with other things. But if you do have a rash, you certainly want to report that. Uh, certainly, uh, electronic means are very useful. Rashes sort of come and go sometimes. And uh, it's been very helpful for me for patients to send that in. Maybe they uh, contact me through our electronic medical record with a picture. Uh, You can do that that uh, sort of shows what that rash looks like, and then we can better understand what to do. Or, uh, but oftentimes you have to just come into the physician's office so that you can show them uh, what's going on. And we treat that based on basically what kind of problems that you're having. So, um, you know, what's causing it really drives what our therapy is. So we don't want to just throw some steroid cream on a rash uh, across the board. That's not very helpful in some instances. We want to try to figure out what's going on first. Let's go to David in Horn Lake. Good morning, David. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I got two questions that are totally unrelated. One of them is late night on uh, a religious station, they're advertising Stem cell activators, 27 different stem cell activators, and they got a little marquee footable across the bottom of the screen claiming these 27 different uh, stem cell activators will help or potentially cure just about every disease on Earth. I was wondering if there's any truth to it or if there's been any any double-blind placebo studies on it or if it's just snake oil. Yeah, is that the first question? Yeah, that's the first let me, let me take it. So snake oil, that's what I can say about that. So, you know, the, a lot of I've seen these commercials saying, hey, these are things that stimulate the natural stem cells that your body has. And stem cells are something that we call pluripotent cells, meaning they have the ability to become just about anything in your body. They have the ability to become bone, to become blood cells, to become muscle, to become skin. And under the right conditions in signaling, which is an internal process that is derived from the cells around it and where these cells go, that can in turn, they can have basically brand new cells. Now they come from wherever you get them. Now we used to do these stem cell transplants where, and we still do some uh, that come from somebody else. They can also take stem cells from individual people and then they're sort of, uh, you know, grow those under certain media and then inject those back. But as far as anything that can induce those to do something, The only induction that really works is the one that's in the body itself. So once you inject those back in the body in certain situations, if you inject them in the bone marrow, they can become, uh, you know, a new set of uh, cells that produce the components of the blood, including white cells and red cells and platelets. 
But if you don't, there's not really anything you can treat them with. That would be great, actually, if we could do that. There is some research being done on that to tease it out, because we'd love to grow some new organs like kidneys and hearts made out of the same genetic material and programming that the person's own tissues were. That way we wouldn't have to worry about rejection. That is way in the future. Uh, There is some research going on about that. But as far as anything you can just take, and as far as curing every disease, that's really a misrepresentation of what stem cells actually do. Stem cells are those early, early cells that can become anything, as we mentioned, and um, it's really, they're going to become tissues. They're not going to cure a disease necessarily uh, in, you know, like diabetes or that kind of thing. Now, you could, you know, take out somebody's pancreas or you could grow a pancreas potentially down the road and put that in somebody, but we really don't have that, that technology now and certainly don't have anything we can say, hey, take this, it'll induce all the stem cells in your body to do different things and cure you of all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to call snake oil on that one, although the research Research in the future is going to be really, I think, exciting to see what what we come up with with stem cells. Second question. Since I have a family history of uh, uh, brain neurological diseases and whatnot, how would you go about donating your brain to science? Maybe they could use it for experimentation or find maybe a cure for some of this stuff? Yeah, different ways you can do that. I would contact somewhere like UMMC or another academic uh, medical center and tell them that you're interested in doing that. There's different ways that you can do it, but it's a, a organ donor program. So um, and you can say, hey, if you want, you know, just to look at everything that's, uh, you know, that I've gone through and everything when after I die and use it to the best of, you know, how you want to do that. Or you can specifically say, I want it to go for this purpose. They'll be able to give you a, um, a listing of those kinds of things. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. But I'm not in the studio this morning, so it's a best of program. You're hearing some phone calls from recent shows. Let's go to Sean from Olive Branch. Good morning, Sean. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Okay, I have a problem. Sometimes I just notice this when I wake up in the morning. Uh huh. I have a bruise on my arm. You know what could be causing it? Same place every time. Yes. Yeah, it's and does it tend to go away with time normally, like four to five days it starts to fade? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what location on your arm? Uh, it's my upper arm, uh-huh. uh, like below my shoulder, below my shoulder, like in the middle. Okay, like the like the, sort out, of the, the outer arm, the outer. Gotcha, okay. Um, several different things. If it's the same place like that every time, well, go ahead. Well, yeah. It's kind of it may move around, but it's in that it's in that area. Gotcha. Okay. And is it is it sore also when you touch it right there? No, no, it's not sore. Okay. There may be um, so as as we get older, this can happen too. So there there's some uh, different places in our body that have a higher um, concentration of capillaries. So those capillaries are those really small blood vessels that help to uh, supply blood to different areas, and um, in some instances, uh, particularly if you have repeated trauma, even minor trauma, you can get a bruise. So a bruise, all a bruise means is you've had some bleeding underneath the skin. So okay. it, it doesn't have to be like a cut or anything, you know, that's 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 really deep from the outside of the skin. But that there's probably some blood vessels in that area. They're a little bit more fragile and for whatever reason, they're getting, you know, traumatized a little bit. It may be something that happens in your sleep. Um, and, you know, that's why I was asked, trying to, to tease out, you know, sort of where it is. Upper arm is mainly, you know, so running into some things or if uh, sometimes even, you know, with um, – uh, if somebody's like, um, you know, touch, you know, grabbing you or something like that from time yeah. to time, sometimes kids will do that. I'll see that to the parents. They'll be like, I have this bruise on my arm and I'll ask, you know, I'll see them in the, in the, um, examining room and they'll be like, well, this is, this is what's happening. My, the, my kid is, uh, grabbing my arm a good bit. Um, but whatever the reason, that's what sort of is occurring. Now, if you had them other places, no. th- then I'd be a little bit more concerned about, Okay, is this a platelet disorder? Is this a coagulation factor disorder? But really, you know, upper body, that's probably something that you're repetitively um, just, you know, 
uh, having some minor trauma to that area just to cause a little bit of blue, bruising underneath the skin. But I don't think it's necessarily anything to, to uh, um, check out unless unless it becomes a lot more painful or you notice a lump or a bump underneath there um, okay. that is um, enlarging. Then you may want to have somebody just check it out. And that wouldn't be such a bad idea either just to say, hey, can you okay. take a look at this area? But I bet it's just some local minor trauma that's just sort of escaping you. And I'll just, from time to time, I'll do this. I'll run into something or I'll, you know, I'm busy doing something and I'll injure myself and I don't even know it. Um, yeah. And, but that's probably what's going on. Okay. Uh, would you talk, I have an itchy back too, so I'm going to uh, take your advice. Cause my mm-hmm. back is it, so bad. I keep a fork in my, in my purse. Yeah. Oh, just and, to scratch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the doctor, he gave me a, a, a cream, but it works. But if I stop using it, start itching again. So I don't, yeah. you know, I'm going to those, fun- those fungal infections I talked about are very common, and there are some other types of cream, things like ketoconazole um, or even oral medication sometimes that you can uh, take. Um, there's one that we use in kids a lot called Greasy Fulvin that if you take it and then exercise, it actually comes out in the sweat glands and helps to treat that. But it's very common. There's all kinds of different funguses that can... Uh, they love to hang out on our skin, particularly in hot summer months where there's a lot more uh, sweating that goes on. So that that may be something, too, that you may want to just uh, have them look at. I didn't mention this to our earlier caller, but sometimes uh, UV light is used, like those UV lamps that you can see different things uh, with. Yeah. And they'll use that in the exam room. And sometimes there are certain types of funguses that fluoresce, so they change color, so they'll be brighter when you use the UV lamp. So um, all kinds of different ways to do that. The scrapings are probably the best way because they'll just gently scrape off some skin. And if it has, you know, significant amounts of the fungus on there, they can grow that and identify which type and know exactly how to treat it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Sure. Anyone talking about hemorrhoids. Now I know of a couple of people that said they had a little slight or uh, severe hemorrhoid. Uh, issues and uh, I, I, I've never heard anybody, you know, come up say anything concerning it or say what to cause it or what would help it or what needs yeah. to be done or what. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason you probably haven't heard that a whole lot, Major, is people don't like to talk about that area very much. So (laughs) it doesn't mean it's not there and people don't have it. It probably means that they're not really comfortable with talking about it. That's one of those things that I'm sure a lot of people are like, yeah, yeah, I got those, but I don't want to call in about that. But it is common. Um, You know, it's, it's something that a lot of people deal with. It can cause a lot of discomfort. Uh, so basically, a hemorrhoid is, you know, we, we have all these blood vessels in our GI tract. And uh, even, you know, at the opening in the rectum and the anus right there, uh, there's a lot of blood vessels that, that are in that area. And basically, a hemorrhoid is when you have an enlargement of those blood vessels. And they can be very uncomfortable. It causes a lot of of uh, burning sensation uh, around that area. Um, it can be painful, in, particularly if you're sitting for long periods of time or you're straining to get you know a stool out. Um, they can also bleed, so they can rupture um, and uh, bleed in the stool. A lot of people will present and say, "Hey, I've got bleeding," uh, and it turns out to be hemorrhoids. They can be in different places, so that sometimes you'll hear them call, called internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids, and that just that just um, is is a description of where they are, right around the rectum or anus. So if they're if they're uh, mild, there are a lot of um, there's a lot of things that you can do. The topical steroids are one. So things like Anusol. They've been used pretty successfully to treat those, and basically that it's a steroid that it that goes up into that area in your rectum, right where those hemorrhoids are, and over time that can cause a a decrease in in inflammation of those tissues. It, does, it usually doesn't make them go away completely, but it does treat them enough to where you can you can uh, not have all the symptoms of it. And or yeah, deal with it. Where well, you can live with them, that's right. They're they're your friends that you don't want. Um, <laughs> now, if they're big enough and they cause some problems, actually, they can. Uh, you know, the, either the GI doctors or uh, a surgeon 
can just like they do when they do a colonoscopy can go up in there and there's different ways that they can treat it they can uh, they can put a little band around those blood vessels and then they fall off uh, and and don't cause as many problems Um, and then helping to prevent them is a big thing so having lots of fiber in your diet so that you have soft stools and not constipation that's that can be one thing that can help prevent them Claudine, glad to have you on from Jackson. Yes, I'm calling about a uh, condition of shingles and the eye, and the right eye. If you see what you know about that, my husband is. We moved here in 1999. He's around 65, and he developed shingles, and uh, it was how and treated. But uh, about two, almost two years ago, he developed a, a built a very dry eye condition with a yellow mucus in his right eye, because that is also um, his vision is very poor in that eye. And he's been under a doctor's care for over a year and a half or more for that condition. It's improving some. There's less mucus, but, again, the vision is bad. He has glaucoma, and now he has a cataract that could be operated on if the mucus wasn't there. Um, I was wondering if, if he also wanted to know, ask you if um, having dental implants, would that have an effect on his condition as well? Yeah, great, great questions. There's lots of things that can affect the eye, and sometimes you run into several different things all at once. Um, now, one of the most severe complications with shingles is if it's in that same, what we call the dermatome, which is this the nerve that it's affecting, uh, that it affects the top of the um, um, top of the um, um, uh, right at the eyebrow, basically that can affect the eye too. So those two nerves there in the face that control either um, the upper cheekbone area or above on the forehead. And if it does affect the eye, you could lose your vision. Um, and so it needs to be treated aggressively. Most of the time patients are admitted to the hospital for that and uh, ophthalmology is on board. They receive IV uh, medication to try to reduce that infection. I'm not but sure it can't. What the infection was, but I, I don't recall him saying it was in, in, the, in that area. But the doctor diagnosed it as being because he said the dry because of shingles. Yeah, and it can. That's what I was about to say. It, it can. You can have long-term side effects with that. So you can have really any kind of uh, a viral infection can cause that. But shingles is a nasty one that can have a persistence where it's actually damaged some of the eye's ability to lubricate itself. And any time you have a dry eye like that uh, that doesn't lubricate uh, for whatever reason, you can cause chronic infections and a breakdown of the tissues on the surface of the eye, uh, particularly on the cornea, that clear part in the center that sort of yeah. protects the structures underneath. And and you can even have problems uh, further back in the eye after after shingles. and. Most, you know, that's one of the reasons, one of the questions I get from patients is, hey, I've had shingles, so I don't really need the shingles vaccine, do I? And I would say, no, actually, you do. And uh, particularly because you've had shingles, you really need it uh, to try to prevent a second, you know, second infection. And there's some pretty good data, too, to that because it increases your antibody levels against the virus that causes that, that even if you don't see what's going on, it's going to protect you from some of the other things that may be brewing under the surface. So, um, you know, getting a good ophthalmologist that is very, it's just like a, you know, we don't think about ophthalmologists as surgeons, but they're trained that way. Uh, So they're sort of an amalgam of, of medical and surgeons. But you know, they you need a good ophthalmologist that is very comfortable and has seen a lot of patients with the thing, particularly when you get beyond just the normal, uh, you know, visual changes over age or even cataracts. Even then, somebody who's very, you know, proficient at what they do and is, has a lot of experience. So you may want to ask about seeing a specialist for that. And there, there's a lot of good um, – it's hard to keep up with so many of the, of the new things that are going on in ophthalmology to treat specific illnesses of the eye uh, and chronic conditions of the eye. So, um, But they've got a lot of different things that they can do now. They have injections, which sounds horrid, but in a lot of, yeah. a lot of ways, you know, for some conditions can, uh, can really improve things. And it's really they, they've really got a lot of things in their arsenal, but they're the right people now. If it's if it's been caused by a virus or you have an acute viral episode, an infectious disease specialist might be somebody too to, to check into. But it sounds like 
this is after the fact, and the ophthalmologist yeah. is probably going to be your best person. Now, how do I go about finding a specialist? I'm sorry? How do we go about finding a specialist for the eye? I know we have this eye clinics and whatever in the, in the phone director. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, knowing the ophthalmologists here at UMC, I know we have a lot that specialize in different areas. For instance, we have a retina specialist. We have, uh, you know, some that do different things. I would just ask your current eye physician and say, your eye doctor, your ophthalmologist, to say, hey, is there anybody more specialized in this certain area, or who would you recommend for a second opinion that has, you know, experience in this? And you may end up, you know, not having anything other than what your ophthalmologist currently can do. But I think that's worthwhile, particularly when you're talking about your eyesight. Yes. He was told he had, had an ulcer on the cornea when we saw the doctor, doctor in Dallas, Texas, and they wanted to treat him. But um, unfortunately, our insurance was only for Mississippi and wasn't for Texas. And uh, But they wanted him to go to see a cornea specialist at that time. I, I believe that, that our spot is, 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 has, been, has been healing, according to his doctor. Yeah, and, and yeah, cornea specialist would be, particularly with that kind of injury to it, um, that would be key. Even if it's healed up, I mean, I would if I was him, I would like to have, you know, somebody who specializes in the area at least to look at it and to say, yeah, it looks good. You don't need to come back to me. You're doing everything correctly that you need to do. But there may be something else that could possibly, you know, improve some things a little bit. So, I, I personally, I think it's worthwhile. And, um there's a lot of good corneas. I don't know off the top of my head any any specialists or where they are, but uh, certainly I think if it's not in the state, it's pretty close, you know, in New Orleans or somewhere like that. So, um, but yeah, I would I would probably want a cornea specialist just to take a look at it as a second opinion to make sure there's not anything else to do. Okay, you don't think the implants would have any any effect on, on them at all, dental implants? Uh, no, I don't think so. Now, sometimes you run into problems with dental implants with referred pain, uh, but generally those are pretty well tolerated and they don't affect the eye. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and funding is provided in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and support from listeners just like you. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.